Good morning. Welcome to all who are here and all who are listening to us by way of live stream. We gather together to worship and praise, adore, express our love and thanks to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is indeed the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Sovereign One, the Holy Messiah. Psalm 98, the 98th division of Psalm, declares these words. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Psalm 98, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for once again you have blessed us to assemble together on this another Lord's Day, another day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We rejoice, Heavenly Father, because Jesus is Lord. We rejoice, Heavenly Father, because Jesus has accomplished our redemption. We rejoice because Jesus has been raised and, and reigns forevermore. We rejoice because Christ shall return for us and we shall forever be with the Lord. We rejoice this morning, Heavenly Father, because of your goodness and your mercy that has followed us and that has trailed us and that has been with us all the days of our lives. We give you thanks this morning. Heavenly Father, as we think of your goodness and we think of your mercy and we think of your holiness, we are reminded again of our sinfulness. Oh, Heavenly Father, we confess that we sinned against you. Oh, forgive us, Heavenly Father. Forgive us for not loving you and cherishing you above all things and above everyone and even above ourselves. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for the commandments that we have rebelled against knowingly. Forgive us for the commandments that we have broken even unknowingly. Oh, Heavenly Father, forgive us for all the, the sinful desires of our heart, the sinful actions of our, our, of our lips and our hands. Forgive us, Heavenly Father. Cleanse our hearts from all of our foolish unrighteousness. In your holy presence, sin never makes sense. So forgive us for our foolishness. We bring no excuses. None makes sense. Have mercy upon us according to your loving kindness and your tender compassion. And oh, Heavenly Father, we have gathered to worship you. We have gathered, Heavenly Father, in troubled times. We have gathered, Heavenly Father, in the midst of a pandemic. We have gathered, Heavenly Father, in the midst of a lot of fearfulness. And, but Lord, we gather knowing that you are Lord and we have no reason to fear. We, you are Lord and we have no reason to fear. Our trust is in you. 
Our hope is in you. Our confidence is in you. Father God, and we know you are the sovereign maker and creator of the heavens and the earth. And Lord, ultimately we know that even the pandemic is a gift for your people. Help us, Lord, not to misuse your gift for our own sinful and selfish purposes. For your gifts, Heavenly Father, are designed to grow us and mature us in the faith that we may be more and more like our Savior. So, Heavenly Father, help us to join you in the work that you're doing in us. No, oh, Heavenly Father, I pray for grace to worship you. To worship you, all who are here and all who are listening. Help us, dear God. Though I pray for those who are listening, help them, dear God, to discipline themselves to not listen in a casual way in detached way. Your word is too great for that. Your voice is too great for that. Worship, you are too great for that. You deserve undivided attention, devotion, and worship. I pray for those, Heavenly Father, who are listening. I pray for all who are here. Give us grace to worship you and to focus our hearts on you and you alone. I pray for salvation for the lost. Lord, have mercy on those who know not Christ. Save Heavenly Father. As your word goes forth, I pray that you would save. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. I pray for the regenerating grace that only he can bring. Give life where there's death. Open eyes where there's blindness. Cleanse from the filth of sin. And I pray for sanctification through the truth of your word. For all of the redeemed of the Lord, I pray that you would lift us and encourage us and strengthen us, renew our minds to submit more and more to the Lordship of Christ. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.
That's what I'm, I'm planning to do. Trust in the Lord until I die. And when I die, I lift up my eyes and see Jesus. It pays to trust in the Lord. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. And I'm happy to report I have peace this morning. I have peace in the midst of this pandemic storm. Because I know who rides the storm. And even the storm is his gift to us for our sanctification. Thank God for the people of God this morning gathered together. The church is essential. We can't live without it. We need to gather together. The people of God need to gather together. This morning, I thank God for you all who are gathered together and all who are listening to us by way of live stream. And I trust and hope that you're praying for the regathering of all of God's people. You're not praying for it, you don't want it. You're not praying for it, you don't want it. Mark chapter 14. So thankful to see Elder and Sister Walden all the way from Cleveland, Ohio, with us this morning. Thank God. Thank God for them, my dear, dear, dear friends. Mark chapter 14, we will con continue our journey in Mark's gospel. Today, I, I want to preach verses 53 through 59 of Mark 14. By the way, th thank God for Deacon Sanford. What a wonderful song. Well, amen. Jarvis and Sister Krishna couldn't be here this morning, and just a little side note, there is nothing to be alarmed about, okay, nothing to be alarmed about. They are both doing fine, spoke with Jarvis this morning, doing great, okay. Verse 53 reads this way. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter followed at a distance right into the court of the high priest, and he was sitting with guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore their false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, 
I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and strike him saying, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. It's the word of God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, holy, holy word. The very reading of your word warms our hearts. And I'm reminded that your word is inerrant, it's infallible, it's holy. And here I stand behind this sacred desk. Attempting to handle the holy, your holy word. Oh, Father, I run to the throne of grace. No man is sufficient to handle your word. So I run to the throne of grace and I yield to the Holy Spirit. And I ask that you would use me as an instrument of righteousness. I am a willing slave. I submit. I have nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life. Give your servant grace to preach. As only you can do. Enable me to preach in the demonstration and power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, my desire is for you to get glory, for your word to be heard. I pray for the hearers of your word. You know all the needs of the hearts of your people and you know them all right now. You know the needs better than they know. Apply your word to their hearts. Save and sanctify. Grow in grace. I pray that we will leave here with a greater love, a greater reverence for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The trials of Christ, the trials of Christ. Today, as I stated, I desire to preach verses 53 through 59. I hope I can get that far. <laughs> this wonderful, wonderful, amazing passage, it is very instructive. It's much here for our learning and understanding and application. So the passion narrative continues here as Jesus is led from Gethsemane to the high priest's residence. Let's understand the context. Mark's notice that Peter followed and got as and got as hot as far, excuse me, as the high priest courtyard, verse 54. Mark's notice of that prepares for his denial in the next episode, started in verses 66 through 72. This is the first of two trial scenes in Mark 
a Jewish one before the Sanhedrin, which we're looking at today, and a Roman one before Pilate, the Roman governor, which starts in chapter 15, verses 1 through 15. The purpose of the Jewish hearing is to gain evidence to be used against Jesus to gain a capital sentence from the Roman governor. We know that's their purpose according to verses 63 and 64 of this passage. Matthew follows Mark's basic structure while John and Luke mention additional trial phases. In, in John's gospel, the Jewish trial comes in two stages, with hearings before Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest, Caiaphas, and then he's taken to Caiaphas in John's gospel, chapter 18, starting at verse 12, running to verse 23. Luke includes an additional phase in the Roman trial in his writings as Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, who is in Jerusalem for the Passover fest festival. Herod interrogates Jesus and returns him back to Pilate in Luke 23, 7 through 12. That's the context in which this sets. The episode here in our, in our passage is made up actually of five scenes. We have an introdu introduction in verses 53 and 54. We have false testimony against Jesus in verses 55 and through 59. We have the dialogue between the high priest and Jesus in verse 60 and 62. We have the accusation of blasphemy and condemnation by the Sanhedrin in verses 63 and 64. And we have the abusive treatment of Jesus in verse 65. That's the basic structure of this passage. So something else I find interesting that we have seen time and time again in Mark's gospel. We've seen before his sandwich structure. You know that sandwich structure where, whereby he begins to talk about an episode and then it is interrupted by something else. Then he finishes the episode and then he picks up what interrupted the episode that sandwich structure. And we see it, uh, beloved, again here. The account of the arrest and trial, starting in verse 53, is interrupted actually twice. First, by the statement about Peter's following at a distance and entering the courtyard, verse 54, and then is interrupted again by Peter's actual denial in verses 66 through 72. How many of you know you need your Bibles to follow me? That's the only book I preach from. The account uh, concludes with the Sanhedrin's plan to take Jesus to Pilate in chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Now you may ask, why is the sandwich structure here in Mark? What is the relationship of the two scenes? What two scenes? The scene with Peter denying Christ and the scene with Jesus standing before the Sanhedrin. What is the relationship? Well, it's pretty clear. The relationship is one of contrast. While Jesus faithfully testifies that he is the Messiah, suffering condemnation and beating, Peter denies that he even knows Jesus, escaping punishment but suffering shame and humiliation. It's one of contrast. Contrast Peter with Jesus. Listen, beloved, we have only one disciple that never fails. <laughs> and that's Jesus 
the Christ. Jesus represents the model disciple who will ultimately gain true life by losing his physical life while Peter denies Christ to protect his physical life. Have I got somebody here? As Jesus taught, those who are ashamed of him will suffer shame and loss. So, beloved, as we pull this together, at Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin, false charges against him fail. But when questioned by the high priest, Jesus acknowledges that he is the Messiah and the Son of God who will be vindicated as the exalted and returning Son of Man. Jesus is already looking to his return. This is enough to provoke a charge of blasphemy by the high priest and condemnation by the Sanhedrin. Though seemingly a disaster for Jesus, God's plan of redemption moves forward toward his death as a ransom for our sins. So God uses what looks like a disaster Y'all don't hear me, do you? God uses what looks like a disaster to accomplish our redemption. That's amazing. Someone may ask, Pastor, why in the world are you having services with numbers rising? Because I believe that. God uses what looks like disaster to accomplish his purpose. <laughs> Do I have any warriors here? See, I just happen to believe what Tim just sung. I will trust in the Lord. Okay. Let's, uh, let's break this passage down. Let's God give us grace to preach. I want you to see in verses 53 and 54, I want you to see the sinful circumstances of the trial. The sinful circumstances of the trial. Let's pick it up at verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter followed at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. I want you to note a few things about these sinful circumstances. Note first the superior in the circumstances. Their superior, I mean. And they led Jesus to the high priest. Now, as I stated in my introduction, John, John's account fills in a little more details. John actually followed Jesus to the high priest's house too according to John 18 and 15. And from John, we learn that before Jesus was taken to Caiaphas' house, according to John 18, 13, they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of, of, of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So while Jesus was taken be, before Annas, Caiaphas would have time to gather the Sanhedrin at his house for this impromptu trial. The speed which, with which he was able to do this reveals the entire council's eagerness to try and do away with Jesus. The fact that those who arrested Jesus first brought him to Annas proves that Annas himself was actually the ultimate power behind the plot to kill Jesus. 
He ultimately, he ultimately had to authorize the deed, and without his sanction, the evil plot never would have gone forward. Also, the fact that the conspirators took him to Annas before they went to Caiaphas reveals the true nature of Caiaphas' high priesthood. He was actually a puppet under his father-in-law's control. How many of you know no one needs to be controlling you but Jesus? You'll always act foolish when somebody else is in control. The Jewish leaders that made the arrest gathered in the residence of the high priest Caiaphas to examine Jesus in Mark's account here. The homes of Annas and Caiaphas apparently shared a common courtyard. It was typical in that culture for sons and son-in-laws to build homes adjacent to or attached to the parents' home. That, that's why the courtyard makes sense and they were able, able to uh, 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 transport Jesus so quickly. Caiaphas occupied his office for a long time, A.D. 18 to 36. He was a very rude and very sly and deceptive manipulator and opportunist who did not know the meaning of fairness or justice and who was bent on having his own way by any means possible. He did not shrink from shedding innocent blood. What he himself eagerly craved for selfish purposes, he made to look as if it were the one thing needful for the welfare of the people. In order to bring about the condemnation of Jesus, who had already aroused his envy, Caiaphas was willing to use devices which were the product of clever calculation and unprecedented boldness. Jesus was bought, brought before a deceiving, manipulating hypocrite. That's who's judging Jesus. Are you wondering why, why, why I tag this the sinful circumstances of the trial? Well, Look at the superior. But let's keep looking. Not only do we see the superior, uh, look, look at the Sanhedrin in the circumstances. Where's the Sanhedrin? Verse 53, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together, came together. So you have these representatives, the ruling priests, the elders, experts of the law, the, the three groups that actually made up the Sanhedrin, according to chapter 8, verse 31, chapter 11, verse 27, chapter 14, verse 43. This group meeting together actually fulfills the prophecy of Jesus in chapter 8, verse 31. Hmm, who's in control here? This group meeting together actually fulfills the prophecy of Jesus. When Mark says all were present, he means the whole Sanhedrin, not every scribe or elder in Jerusalem, but the whole Sanhedrin. Let me give you some background on the Sanhedrin. The great Sanhedrin was actually patterned after the council of elders that Moses convened in, in Numbers eleven sixteen. 16. Here's how the word of God reads. The Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. So those 70 men plus Moses formed a council of 71 elders whose job it was to govern the Israelites in the wilderness. Follow me. Since Moses... Since Moses' council of elders was the pattern for the Sanhedrin, that council also numbered 71, comprised the Sanhedrin of 24 chief priests plus 46 <laughs> more elders, 
chosen from among the scribes, Pharisees, and Sadducees. So the high priest, Caiaphas here, was both the overseer and a voting member of the Sanhedrin, bringing the number to 71. The odd number ensured that decisions could be reached by majority vote. Now, Moses established godly men. By Jesus' time, the Sanhedrin had become a corrupt and politically motivated body. The word Sanhedrin literally means to sit together. It means to come together for a specific purpose. There's also the idea of, of, herding, of herding together as a group. You know how cows herd together. So that paints a picture for us of what's going on here. The picture is that of the Jewish leaders surrounding or herding around Jesus. There's no question about the evil in their hearts. In fact, the whole proceeding was illegal even according to Jewish law. Let me show you this. Background is important for this passage. It was illegal because of when it was held. The Jews' own laws that regulated their court system prohibited them from having a trial at night or on a feast day. Remember, this is the time of the Passover. This is at night, remember? It was illegal, secondly, because of where it was held. The same Jewish law mandated that all trials conducted by the Sanhedrin were to be held in the hall of hewn stones, which was located on the temple grounds. Hmm. Thirdly, it was illegal because of the way it was held. What's wrong with the way it was held, Pastor? Well, trials were uh, illegal on the eve of the Sabbath, on the eve of the Sabbath, on the eve of the Sabbath, this Friday, the eve of the Sabbath, because Jewish law required a one-day adjournment in the event of a conviction. A guilty sentence can only be handed down the day after trial. The Sanhedrin could not bring charges against a defendant. They could only investigate charges that had been made by others. The charges against Jesus were changed actually during the trial. He was first charged with threatening to destroy the temple. Later, he's charged with blasphemy. They changed the charges. Jesus Christ was allowed no defense before the court. All charges against him should have been thoroughly investigated, and he should have been allowed time to call his own witnesses. The Sanhedrin pronounced the death sentence, and by law, the Sanhedrin could not convict or pass down death sentence. It was just illegal. These circumstances are sinful, wicked, even sinful according to their own laws. But you know what? People flock together to do evil. <laughs> I can't stay there, but people will flock together to do, to, to, to do evil. And I tell you something else, people will flock together to oppose Christ even in the church. It's a lot easier to do evil, isn't it, in a group than when you're alone. <laughs> right? Do y'all look at Matt Dillon? Aren't the bad guys always in a group? That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse 17 and 18, Therefore go out from, uh, from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. They're flocking together to oppose Christ. 
Be careful of the company you keep. Tell you something else by way of application. A heart that desires evil will twist the rules. They are twisting their own rules. A people have a desire, a sinful desire to do something, they will figure out a way rationalizing and justifying the matter in their own mind. James, help us here. We need some help, James. Well, James says, I'll help you. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James 4, 17. Help us out, John. 3 John 11. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen Circumstances are evil. It's evil because of the superior. It's evil because of the Sanhedrin. Let me add a third thing. Notice the spectator in the circumstances. Mark notes a spectator. Who's the spectator? One of Jesus' disciples. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. You do know that as Mark wrote his gospel, he got information from Peter, right? Now, before you jump on Peter and say, well, I would have never done that. First of all, I would say, stop lying to yourself. You probably wouldn't even be here <laughs> in the courtyard. But the panic is over for a moment. So Peter's affection reasserted itself. He followed at a distance because he was afraid. But he did follow, right? Eventually, he arrived at the high priest's palace. And as stated before, John's gospel informs us that there was another disciple with Peter. And since this unnamed disciple knew the high priest, he spoke to the girl on duty at the gate, and Peter was let in, according to John 18, 15, and 16. And of course, the other disciple was John himself. The palace uh, was built around an open courtyard that one entered through an archway. It's a spring night. It's cool in Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits at an elevation of about 2,500 feet. Peter sits by the fire with, with guards. Who are the guards? Well, the word can mean servant or assistants of various kinds and could refer to the high priest's servants. John used this word guards for the temple police who arrested Jesus in John 18, 12 and in verse 65. Excuse me, in verse 65, Mark uses it of the guards who took charge of Jesus after the hearing. So who is Peter sitting with? He's sitting with the guards who arrested Jesus in the garden. He's sitting in the courtyard with the guards who came with Judas to arrest Jesus. Just want to insert this as a side note. My, my, my dad preached this verse one time, and he entitled it, Warming at the Devil's Fire. 
These are the temple police who arrested Jesus. Be careful, Peter. Don't you know, as dark as it is, the blaze from the fire will illuminate your face? He's going to be recognized before long. But from where he was sitting, he could see the upstairs room in which the Sanhedrin was meeting to decide Jesus' fate. He's trying to keep a safe distance between himself and Jesus. He's hoping to preserve his life because he doesn't want to be executed along with Jesus. You know, this is the guy who said, if no one else will, I'll die with you. Yeah, that's easier said than done. Peter, at this point, has forsaken a discipleship of costly following for one of safe observation. I'm going to challenge you with this. It's the Lord challenging me with it. Are you following Jesus today from a distance? Do the people whom you interact with each day know that you are a Christian? Can they hear that you are a Christian? Can they see that you are a Christian? I'm not asking whether or not you wear a bracelet on your arm. I'm asking, do they know where your allegiance lies? If they do not, maybe, you're in the text today, following Jesus from a distance because you want to keep a safe enough distance to be with the crowd. I wish I had somebody else in here with me. You want a, you, you want a comfortable Christianity. You want to warm yourself with the world. You want to follow Jesus without cost. So do you agree that the circumstances of the trial were sinful? Sinful because of the superior, Caiaphas? Sinful because of the Sanhedrin? Just a sinful group of of men judging Jesus, and sinful because you have this spectator following from a distance. But I want you to see in verses 55 through 59 the shameful witnesses in the crowd. The circumstances are sinful, but oh my goodness, the witnesses are downright shameful. Notice the shameful witnesses in the crowd, beginning at verse 59. Note first the purpose for the witnesses. It says, now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. Everybody on the Sanhedrin wanted him dead. The main goal, let's get rid of Jesus. But under Roman rule, the Sanhedrin was not authorized to administer capital punishment. So they had a twofold purpose. They wanted to formulate a charge against Jesus that will guarantee his execution at the hands of the Romans who did have the power of capital punishment. Wow. In other words, they wanted to provide charges to justify the death sentence for Jesus. Now you remember that the Pharisees and the Herodians, according to chapter 3, verse 6, plotted to kill Jesus very early in his Galilean ministry. But what set it off was Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem. You know, he cleared the temple. 
He cleared the temple. You know, I, you often wonder, uh, why didn't anybody grab him then? He turning over tables in the temple. He driving out money changers. He messing up everything. You, are you afraid to touch him now? <laughs> the whole trial was a farce because the sentence is decided before the trial begins. The purpose of the witnesses. But notice, notice now the pursuit of the witnesses. Look at the text again. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony. They were seeking. Look at the passion in their pursuit. They were seeking. That word means to hunt, to crave. It means to seek something earnestly. And with the verb in the imperfect tense, it means to seek earnestly and continuously. <laughs> they, got, they wanted somebody on their side. They were, they were sort of like, you know, the, uh, the hypocrites that you find sometime in the church. I know not this one, but sometimes in the church, a new person joins and boom, they try to get him immediately on their side. You know what I'm talking about. There's passion and zeal. They're looking for witnesses, but not just any witness. They want some false witnesses. They're desperate to find anybody that will come forward and make some accusation against Jesus. So this is a passionate pursuit, but it's also a prejudiced pursuit. They want testimony that's going to condemn Jesus. This seeking connotes an attempt to determine and control rather than to submit and follow. Matthew says in Matthew 26, 59, they sought false witnesses. It was a prejudice pursuit. So we see the purpose of the false witnesses, of the witnesses. Isn't that shameful, their purpose? But notice the problem with the witnesses. The problem with the witnesses. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. Now at the end of verse 55, you have this, this phrase, but they found none. They were seeking, but they found none. And again, I, 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 love, I, I love the grammar of the word of God and it's sometimes great to uh, uh, just notice it and bring it out in a sermon. Again, you have the imperfect tense, which underlines their continual failure to attain their purpose. <laughs> I mean, if you know, there's nothing but failure when you go against Jesus. I don't care how hard you try, how much you try, how hard you're seeking, how much you're craving, but the end is always failure. Now, the problem with the witnesses here, again, according to the Mishnah, according to Jewish law, there were three categories of testimony. Number one, there was a vain testimony. Number two, a standing testimony. And number three, an adequate testimony. Let me explain briefly each one. A vain testimony, according to Jewish law, referred to accusations that were irrelevant or worthless and could be eliminated at once. In our courts, this is testimony today that will be stricken from the record or the judge will tell the jury, just disregard that. Then there was a standing testimony, and that was a testimony that had relevance and was permitted to stand until it was either confirmed or disproved. Then thirdly, according to Jewish law, there was adequate testimony. And adequate testimony was relevant testimony on, on which two or more witnesses agreed. Only adequate testimony could convict somebody according to their law. 
No to text again. For many bore, what kind of witness? False witness against him. That explains their failure. For there was no lack of witnesses. They had plenty. <laughs> many came forward. Obviously, at the invitation of the Sanhedrin, but no witnesses favorable to, to him was presented at all. All they had that came forward was a bunch of liars. How many of you know that the truth is not in the crowd? I better leave that alone. We think that we have a bunch of people saying the same thing that it has to be true. They had a lot of witnesses. But that was a problem. Their testimony did not agree. Literally, it means uh, the testimony was not equal. It did not match. The law, uh, the law of Moses required exact agreement of two witnesses. And the whole Sanhedrin would have agreed to Moses' law. On the evidence, Moses wrote, Deuteronomy 17, 6, on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Deuteronomy 17, 6. Listen to Deuteronomy 19, 15. These religious people are going against the Bible. A single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with any offense that he has committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. Watch this. It's wrong according to their rules. It's wrong according to the word of God. <laughs> they could not establish. Do you know something? It's harder to agree on a consistent lie than to tell the simple truth. Many witnesses came, but even their lies didn't match. You know why? You will never have continuity with false witness. They're contradicting themselves. <laughs> you know what? The laws of both the Romans and the Jews demanded execution for lying in the capital trial. So if they were to put these witnesses on the stand, according to Roman law, they would have killed their witnesses. They're not seeking the truth. They're seeking to justify what they want to do. Beloved, I want to say to you, False shepherd uses false witnesses. These men are supposed to be the shepherds. They're religious. These guys could have quoted verbatim the Ten Commandments. They were supposed to be the experts in the law. But that's what false witnesses do. False shepherds use false witnesses. You know what makes a false shepherd? Just find a shepherd that doesn't preach Jesus. That's the problem. They didn't preach Jesus. The whole court system was Subverted by lies from the start. 
the whole system. Major sins are committed by the very leaders who are supposed to be the spiritual guides for the nations. They're proving themselves to be a false shepherd because a false shepherd never brings the truth. He always mixes it and then it's no truth. You reject Messiah and now they're leading others to the same death that they're going to. They're seeking to kill God's son. Would you agree that there's a problem with these witnesses? Isn't it shameful? The whole purpose, the whole purpose, beloved, is shameful. The whole pursuit is shameful. And, and, and all of the witness are, witnesses are shameful because nobody agrees. Can't you see them sitting there like, man, I wish he had said, we should have talked to him first. We should have really prepped the witnesses to say what we wanted them to say. These guys were obviously not even clever and deceptive lawyers. They should have at least tried to lead the witness. <laughs> oh, you really mean this, right? <laughs> so one more thing I want you to see here in verses 57 through 59 about this shameful Shameful witnesses. Notice the perversion of the witnesses. These verses are interesting. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, against him, against Jesus, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy. This temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Something strange at the end. Yet even about this, <laughs> their testimony did not agree. How do you find false witness against Someone who's perfectly holy. Uh, excuse me, true witness or lies or sin. You can't get sin out of holiness. It's always going to be wrong. That's why all of the religions are wrong when they declare that Jesus is only a prophet. You can't get sin out of holiness. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. You can't find a mistake. You can't find a slip up. You can't even judge him truthfully according to your own rules. There's no failure in Christ. There's no sin in Christ. Nothing but holy, holy, holy. He knew no sin. He's always going to come out holy. Oh, my goodness. Glory to God. Notice the perversion of the witnesses, and I'm done. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands, even about this testimony. Even about this, their testimony did not agree. I know I just read it. You need to hear it again. So... Somebody says, has an aha moment. Somebody stood up. All these guys messed up, all these false witnesses. But I, I have something. 
The phrase some stood up could signal that one of the Sanhedrin members themselves stood up. That's an emphatic we. We heard him say. We heard it with our own ears. This is personal knowledge. Somebody didn't tell me this. This is reliable testimony coming from a reliable witness. I was there when he said it. You were there and you still didn't get it right according to verse 59. <laughs> there must have been some cross-examination going on here. It had to be because according to verse 59, even about this, they didn't agree, so there was some cross-examination going on, and they couldn't even agree about what they say they heard. But it is a serious charge. It's serious because as the center of Jewish worship and the seat of the Sanhedrin's power, the, the temple symbolized the essence and hopes of Judaism. It's a serious accusation because throughout the Roman world, the destruction of places of worship was regarded even by, the, by Rome as a capital offense. We heard him say it. I know he said it. He said it. He, he said himself, I will destroy this temple. The word for temple doesn't refer to the entire complex, but it speaks of the sanctuary the sacred sanctuary itself. He's going to destroy the Holy of Holies, according to them. And I can hear them saying, we know he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem because he said, I will destroy this temple made with hands. Made with hands mean carefully built by skilled labor. So, it's our temple he's talking about. And then this dude says, in three days, <laughs> he, he's going to replace it with one not made with hands. Okay. Say, Pastor, where's the perversion? Follow me. I'm coming to a close. Follow me. Where is the perversion? Well, first of all, the witnesses distorted Jesus' words. They're referring to Jesus' words in John chapter 2, verse 19. And in John chapter 2, verse 19, I read it, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Sounds similar, doesn't it? But what happened was they twist Jesus' imperative to the leaders. Because when Jesus said destroy this temple, he's talking about them. He's saying you destroy. He didn't say I destroy. So they twist what Jesus actually, actually said, making Jesus the destroyer. And Jesus was saying you destroy. Follow me. Not only do they twist, but they misinterpret Jesus' words. Because Jesus was referring to his body and to the destruction uh, of his body and the resurrection of his body. So Jesus was actually saying, destroy this temple, meaning his body, and I'll raise it in three days. That's a problem, right? That's a problem. As I go to a close, that's a problem, isn't it? Because they are presenting that they're saying what Jesus said when really they're not. It's a perversion of the truth which means it's no truth at all in terms of what they say. So what's going on here? Well, 
Why can't they get it right? This is why they can't get it right. They can't get it right. They can't get the truth right because they reject the truth. Y'all don't hear me. Jesus is the truth. He is the very embodiment of truth. He declares truth because he is truth. And you reject Jesus Christ, I don't care how much you read this book, you can't get it right. Again, that's why all religions that reject the truth about who Jesus really is, fully God, fully man, they can't get the Bible right. The whole volume of the book is about him. And if your mind is closed to Christ, your mind is closed to the truth. They reject Jesus. You know why? Because they, they want to run their own lives. They reject Jesus. You know why? Because they want to build their own image. They reject Jesus. You know why? Because they want personal recognition. They want their own so-called security. They want their wealth to continue. Help us, Luke. Help us. It's the same as Luke 19, 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. Now listen to me, saints. I used to believe that, that I didn't want Jesus to reign over my life. I didn't want Jesus in control of my life. And when the Lord saved me, when I found out who he was, when he, when he, when he revealed himself to me th through the preaching of his word, when the Holy Spirit illumined my mind to understand and find out that Jesus is Lord, I found out something. Hey, glory. I found out that he was reigning over me whether I wanted him to or not. I found out something. That every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. I found out something that nobody voted to make him Lord. He was already Lord, but salvation is bowing to him as Lord. So whether you want him to reign over you or not, guess what, he still does. Glory to God. I hear you, you don't want the Jesus to reign over you. You wanna run your own life. Guess what, he's already Lord. And for those who preach the no gospel that says when a person gets saved, you make him Lord of your life, that's a lie. He's already Lord. Salvation is you finding out. Salvation is you submitting to what's already the truth. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. Confession is just agreeing with what's already true. Lord, help me to finish this thing. You know they used to get nine by 12, so I gotta finish. It, this is a perversion, right? Their minds are closed. John helps us here in John 15, 25. Oh, I hope you're listening to the word of God this morning. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. And I say to you this morning, who are rejecting Jesus Christ, who has not bowed to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you have no cause. There's no cause in this passage. There's nothing, there's no legitimate cause at all in this passage. Listen, they know he was a healer. They know he had the power of God. They know that no man can do these miracles unless God be with him. 
No doubt in my mind, that herd he walked on water. The herd he calmed the winds. The herd that he showed compassion in to the, even the lepers that were outside the gate. There's no cause for this. That's why in the end, when Jesus returns and you rejected him, listen, Jesus will cast people in the lake of fire because there was no cause for that. No cause. You had no right. He's the sovereign creator. Bow to your creator. I better leave that. They hated me without a cause. And notice how they twisted and distorted the words of Christ. They just twisted and distorted. That's a lot of that going on in the pulpit today. You know what truth is? Here's, here's what truth is. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, the will, the character, the glory, and the being of God. Truth is that which is consistent with the mind, the will, the character, the glory, and the being of God. So truth then is the self-expression of God. Truth then is always theological. Truth is always theological because it has to agree with theos. It has to come from theos, right? They did not rightly divide the word of truth and truth is only truth when you're saying exactly what God said. Right? So, don't say a man preach because he took you to scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture to prove his point. He showed me in the scripture well, if it was inconsistent with the mind, the will, the, the glory, and the being of God, if it's inconsistent with any other passage of Holy Scripture, it can't be truth. Right? And I got some words. You can't rightly divide the word and reject Jesus. You don't have anything to argue with. You're going to argue with the, the Bible, according to Colossians, it's called, the, Colossians 3, it's called the words of Christ. The message of Christ. Truth can't contradict itself. Contradict, the word contradiction means nonsense. So, when you hear the, these men twisting and distorting the word to prove their point. It can't be what God is saying. A man is not a preacher because he opens the Bible. There's a lot that blows my mind in this passage. But as I look at in closing, as I look at the sinful circumstances in verses 53 and 54 of the trial, then in verse 55 through 59, I look at the shameful witnesses in the trial. There's one other thing that blows my mind. And as I think about it, I have trouble staying on the ground. I'm looking at Jesus, and here's what I see. Jesus willingly submits to all of this illegal, unjust, foolish, lying, manipulating, deceptive activity.
Why in the world would Jesus submit himself to all this foolishness? I mean, he's the, he is the truth. He could have just tore, he, he could have just tore down every argument against him. But at this point, he said nothing. Out of the lies, no testimony agree. Why doesn't Jesus just walk out and say, call me back when you, when you can get some reliable witnesses? I thought about that and it blew my mind because I said, wait a minute. That's Philippians 2.14. 2.4, excuse me, Philippians 2.4. What is Philippians 2.4? Jesus is actually thinking of others more important than himself. Pastor, how do you see that? Well, what do you mean he's thinking of others more important to himself? Because Jesus is submitting to all this foolishness for us. Jesus says, I'll take the illegal activity. I'll take all the lies. I'll take all the foolishness. I'll take all this unjust judging of who I am. But I'm taking it for you. If lies gets me to the cross, I'm so committed to the will of the Father. I'm so committed to the redemption of all that the Father gave me. I'm so committed that I take it all if it gets me to the cross. Y'all don't hear me. <laughs> Glory to God. I see my silent Savior, but he's silent for me. He could have ripped them all, but he's silent for me. Glory to God. When God seems silent, don't think he's not working. The gospel declares, when God seems silent, don't think he's not at work. He's silent for his own purpose. He's silent for his own glory. It looks like he's losing, but he's winning. <laughs> What a savior. And let me encourage you with, it, with this passage. You see Jesus submitting to all this foolishness? I want to remind you of Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's Jesus speaking. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Just zero in right here. And may this, don't ever forget this. Look what Jesus says about his heart. We think differently so many times. But look what he says about his heart. He says, I'm, I'm gentle. And I'm lowly. He says, that, that, that's the kind of heart I have. When I think of Jesus being gentle and lowly in heart, you know one of the great truths I think of? He's easily accessible. So why aren't you coming to him? Jesus says, I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart. I'm talking to the saved right now. We sin and we think we can't come to him. <laughs> we mess up real bad and we think we can't go back to him. We say, I wish I, oh, I, I did a thing that I asked, I, 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 I did a thing that I asked forgiveness for yesterday, and here I am doing it again, and you think you can't come to him. Well, here Jesus, Jesus says, yes, you can. You come 
in repentance and faith. I'm always gentle and lowly in heart. No hoops to jump through. No walls to climb. Just come. And I say to the unsaved, you can't get right and come. You can't get your life together and come. You can't stop sinning and come. Come to Jesus just like you are. You say, but wait a minute. I'm weary. I better leave that. I'm wounded and I'm sad. But he's gentle and lowly. You can find in him a resting place. And he will make you glad. The trials of Christ. And we leave again saying, what a savior. Jesus is awesome, even when he say nothing. <laughs> you know what that means? He doesn't even have to say anything to be awesome because he's awesome just by virtue of who he is. What is sovereign power doing submitting to this? Does it deny that he's sovereign? No, it argues for his sovereignty. God bless you. I love you, saints. And I'll dismiss us with prayer. Heavenly Father, I really, really feel that it's difficult when I talk to you to find adequate words. To express my heart's praise over Christ. Father, your son, I see how far, and I don't see with absolute clarity, but I see how far I've got to go to perform like Jesus. And I know I don't see that clear enough. But oh my goodness, Father. Jesus, what a savior. He had no need within himself to be standing in the midst of all of this foolishness. But he did it for sinful, Foolish people like us. No wonder John said, what manner of love is this? That we should be called the children of God. And so we are. I'm just thankful, Father. And I give you glory. Do what you will in our hearts. Give us submissive hearts, willing hearts. As Paul prayed for people, I pray as well for your people. Strengthen us in our inner man. Strengthen us that we may know more of the height, the depth, the width, the length of your great love for us. And as we rehearse these truths over and over in our mind, I pray, Heavenly Father, that our hearts will rise up with greater love and devotion to Christ our Lord. Thank you. That's all I can say, Father. We didn't bring anything to the table but sin. And you took that upon yourself. <laughs> That's all we had to, to offer was sin. So thank you. I 
ask it all in the rich and the glorious name of Jesus, our Redeemer, our Lord and our Savior.